there was a feeling that this was a barrier that couldn't be overcome because aeroplanes would go out of control and nothing could be done to bring them in. Well, there were a lot of people that said it was impossible. And that's why they talked about the sonic wall. The sonic wall, that means like a brick wall. And a lot of people accepted that. The day that a plane first flew faster than sound was a milestone in the history of aviation. This film is the real story of how it was done. Great risks were taken and lives lost in a venture that many thought to be foolhardy. There was a huge amount of vibration juddering through the aircraft as you got closer to the speed of sound. Each bite beyond a certain limit was fraught with the possibility of disaster. We show unscreened film of the British plane that could have been first to break the sound barrier and reveal the truth about its sudden cancellation. The government threw away with that decision the tremendous lead they had on supersonic flight over the whole world. It was catastrophic. And we explain why the Americans tried to keep the secret of supersonic flight under wraps. It took the rest of the world five years to find out how we flew above the speed of sound. Had we blabbed our mouth, you know, uh, they'd have known it at that time. It was during the war that pilots first experienced the problem of flying too close to the speed of sound. It happened when fighter planes went into steep attacking dives. Some went so fast they began to catch up with the sound waves produced by their own engines. That meant they were approaching the speed of sound itself, 760 miles an hour at sea level, 660 higher up. John Golly, an RAF pilot, accidentally flew into trouble during a raid over occupied France. Well, I was flying the Typhoon, which was really a, a, a seven-ton brute. It was a big, big chap. Uh, three times the size of a Spitfire, twice the size of a Hurricane. It was physically hard to handle when you threw it around, but it was fast. We had no indication that we might be approaching the uh, speed of sound or differences. We had no idea, none whatsoever. Now, I found that first dive that I did was fairly horrific. I remember whipping my Typhoon um, virtually upside down. The speed built up enormously. We were going way over 500 miles an hour. And when I had tremendous vibration, it, it was frightening in a sense that one was fighting to control the aircraft. And one's hands were on the spade grip of the control column, which was getting stiffer and stiffer. All we knew was that we had to get the bloody things out of the dive to survive, and it took a lot of effort. No one knew what happened to planes as they approached the speed of sound. For some reason, the airflow over the wings began to behave unpredictably. Pilots began to speak of an impenetrable wall to high-speed flight, a sound barrier. No official records were kept, but some wartime pilots simply disappeared during high-speed dives. Uh, guys were missing, and, and, and we didn't know. We didn't know what happened to them, or whatever. Their controls could have locked up for some reason or another, which we never knew. We never discussed it. All we knew was that if a guy didn't come back, he'd had it. American pilots faced similar problems during the war. 28 German planes were shot down by flying ace Robert Johnson, but he nearly died when his P-47 Thunderbolt flew too close to the speed of sound. Well, it looked a little bit like an elephant going into combat compared to the Spitfires and those type airplanes. But it was very, it was the fastest prop-driven airplane that we had. 
I, like everybody else, I was wanting to see how fast I could go. Johnson took the plane up to about 30,000 feet and tipped it into a steep dive. My nose, which I thought was straight down, suddenly tucked under and my controls locked. And you could not budge the controls, no matter how hard you wanted to. And believe, you, believe me, your mind was going like this. What to do, what to do, what to do. Well, you were so frightened that you tried everything. And, and of course, then at the bottom of the dive, as it pulled out, you'd black out, so you didn't come to till you're back up to about 19,000 feet. Johnson was lucky. His controls began to work again when dense air slowed the plane as it descended. One of the few women pilots in the 40s also accidentally flew too close to the sound barrier. Anne Carl was doing some acrobatic flying in a thunderbolt when she dived into danger. Funny things began to happen inside the uh, cockpit. Dust was flying around and uh, charts and uh, uh, the stick would bang over against my, my leg. And I tried various things to try and get out of this uh, situation. It was certainly not a pleasant feeling to have the plane out of control. And right below me, I could look down and see a, um, a farmer on his tractor going back and forth slowly, not realizing what was happening up above him. We were just going so fast that I didn't think I could probably get out. The thing is, there's so, you just have to do things. You can't sit there and be frightened. <laughs> You've got to just quickly try everything you can. Like Johnson, Carl also regained control of her plane as it neared the ground. As we were coming out of the dive, I wondered why I was saved, as a matter of fact. I thought it was an experience that I would certainly not forget. Some pilots who flew too near the barrier didn't survive. I was just standing out there watching, waiting to take off. And I saw these two airplanes just come screaming down, straight down. And wasn't as much else to watch except they went in, into the water. We didn't know what had happened. We assumed that they just plain old dived in, and they did plain old dive in, but we didn't know that they could not get out of it. It was a, an uncontrollable situation once you hit that certain speed. Wartime leaders in London and Washington had little time to worry about the sound barrier. The defeat of Germany was their priority. But in 1942, the British government got its hands on a brand new German fighter plane that made a forced landing in Wales, the Fokker Wolf 190. The government was worried about the speed and maneuverability of the plane. To keep pace with the Germans, it ordered scientific tests to find out what happens close to the sound barrier. The Fokker Wolf 190 certainly provided an additional spur to the British designers and test flyers to get the edge on the 190. But we were on the edge all the time of having to push, push, push to get that little bit of extra which would make the difference between life and death in some of these dogfights and fighter sweeps which were going on at the time. But this was a very difficult period because we were approaching the speed of sound and airplanes were becoming uncontrollable because it wasn't realized what the problem was. This was something quite new. The so-called sound barrier was beginning to be approached. the experts decided to conduct tests in wind tunnels. 
They thought the experiments would spare pilots' lives and reveal what happens to aircraft near the speed of sound. But they found the equipment just couldn't cope with such high wind speeds. The problems of trying to face up to the control difficulties as we approached the speed of sound was that we couldn't reproduce these in wind tunnels. No wind tunnel could give us the speed of flow over a model aeroplane which would reproduce what we were experiencing in the real aeroplane going at close to the speed of sound. So the only way to approach this was in full-scale testing of actual aeroplanes flying at actual speeds. A select group of pilots were asked to risk their lives to get the answers. One of them was Eric Brown, a member of a government high-speed test unit in Farnborough. He was asked to deliberately fly a Spitfire into this dangerous region. Of course, when you're young and you're in a job like a research test pilot, you are very keen to try and beat this so-called barrier. There is always that feeling you have a ridiculous feeling the young have of immortality. And I think this is what allows you to press on. Were you worried about Eric's safety? Oh, yes. But you must remember, it was, it was a war, and people were being killed in other theatres. So that you didn't feel you were unique. It's much worse than peacetime, test flying because you're, you are unique. Nobody else is, is risking their lives in the same way. But in wartime, everybody was. The plan was to approach the sound barrier in stages to minimize the chance of a disaster. But it meant flying a plane faster than had ever been done before. For all the precautions, it was a highly risky business. I took the aircraft up to a very high altitude of the order of 40,000 feet. There we would have a flat-out run at full throttle for about five minutes to build up maximum steady speed we could. I pushed the aircraft over into a dive off the order of 30 to 40 degrees. At that particular angle, you could begin to feel the first signs of problems. Huge amount of vibration juddering through the aircraft, a lot of noise around the cockpit. Most frightening of all, it became harder and harder to pull the Spitfire out of its dive. The moving parts of the tail that changed the angle of the dive just wouldn't work, no matter how hard the pilot pulled back on the control stick. I was certainly of the opinion that I was getting to my limit. There is always the risk that your muscles will not hold out in this situation and you will relax your grip on the stick and then you, that will allow the aircraft, of course, to go steeper and steeper with end result probably fatal. You know, when you're in the middle of these crises, you're too busy living to analyze them. It's only afterwards you look back in retrospect and think about them. I feel we were all silly. I mean, we really were. We didn't realize the danger that everyone was in. The dangers were only too real. One of the team, Tony Martindale, paid a heavy price for flying a Spitfire very close to the sound barrier. The engine exploded its propeller came off. He escaped with a broken back. Others weren't so lucky. Four of the six test pilots from the high-speed unit at Farnborough died doing these tests. Yes, test pilots had a, always a difficult time, but no time more difficult than when they were being sent up to try and approach the speed of sound with unknown control responses from aeroplanes. Bailing out at those sort of speeds, there weren't ejector seats in those days. 
into a nearly 500 mile an hour slipstream was a thing which was only just survivable and in many cases not survivable. Several test pilots sadly were lost because the airplane went uncontrollable. Very early on, we had a young Canadian pilot and he was sent to us in the high speed unit and he was in a dive and he must have let things go a little too far and it steepened all the way and he went straight into the ground at very high speed indeed. But the risks and the sacrifice brought a breakthrough. By flying planes with different wing thicknesses, they found that supersonic speeds were only possible with very thin wings. Thick wings caused unstable shock waves, making planes vibrate and lose control. A second lesson was learned as well. We realized that piston-engined aircraft were never going to beat the speed of sound. Fundamentally, the drag of the propeller was so high that it would never allow the aircraft to attain those speeds without running into virtually a brick wall. And we just had to wait till something better came along. By 1943, the engine with the power to push a plane through the sound barrier was already in development. It had been invented by Frank Whittle, a brilliant young RAF officer. Whittle's invention was a simple but revolutionary idea. It had just one major moving part, a spinning turbine that compressed air before fuel was added and burnt. It was the world's first jet engine. Its potential power far exceeded anything that the piston engine could deliver. In essence, really, what the jet engine did was provide a simple solution to how to push the aeroplane forward by squirting a jet out of the back faster than the speed of sound. And therefore, the aeroplane had to respond by going faster than the speed of sound itself. But it removed one of the great problems of engines driving aeroplanes through the sound barrier. Whittle had invented the jet engine in 1929, but a short-sighted government ignored him for eight years. They thought it was impractical. In the process, Britain lost its lead in jet technology. Germany had a jet plane in the air by 1939, two years before the British. It was the HE-178, the brainchild of Ernst Heinkel, a far-sighted plane manufacturer who did appreciate the significance of jet power. Hans von Ohain, a young engineer, had independently built the German jet engine that powered the 178. The 178 um, was not built really for uh, very high speed. It was an experimental aircraft. Heinkel envisioned from the success of the 178 to go to a next airplane, which is much faster and possibly go by on the speed of sound. He said to all of us, this is the beginning of a new time of higher and higher speed. That's what he said. By 1942, Germany possessed aircraft that could fly nearer to the speed of sound than those of any other country. One of them, the Messerschmitt 262, a jet fighter, 
could travel at 600 miles an hour. Some even claimed it had broken the sound barrier itself. Heinrich Bove was a German test pilot who flew the plane many times. Ein Flugzeugführer Mutke und er glaubt über Schallgeschwindigkeit gekommen zu sein, aber es hat Schwierigkeiten gegeben und zwar so, dass auch das Flugzeug in Folge von Buffeting von Stößen beschädigt worden ist dass Nieten weggeplatzt sind und dass sich die Haut verformt hat auf, auf der Fläche. Ich glaube es aber nicht. Und andere äh, Professoren und so weiter glauben es auch nicht. The 262 was not designed to break the sound barrier and its engines weren't powerful enough. But the fact that Germany's Air Force had such advanced planes sparked off a race to fly faster than sound. The first comprehensive evidence of the German lead in high-speed jets came in a top-secret intelligence report delivered to the Prime Minister's office in 1943. At the time, Britain only had one functional jet plane in the air, an experimental aircraft. The classified briefing contained reconnaissance photos of German airfields that showed just how far the Allies were lagging behind. The things one could see was scorch marks on grass airfields, and this gave evidence of jet engines before we knew anything more about them. And uh, what were we doing about it? And we were doing jolly little, in fact, apart from desultory help to to whittle. So there's no doubt that these intelligence reports did spur on the Air Ministry to produce really fast jet aeroplanes, which could possibly, if the war went on significantly further, have a, an influence in the actual frontline battles. There was a second spur as well, a British agent's report of a German plan for a supersonic jet. It was only a prototype but Germany's technological know-how had to be taken seriously. It was thought that it's about time we looked to see whether we should go towards flying faster than the speed of sound. Uh, a new concept altogether, although there had been, even before the war, thoughts that one day we might be going faster than sound, but how it would be done, nobody had the foggiest idea. In 1943, the government asked Miles Aircraft, a small plane manufacturer in Reading, to design and construct the world's first supersonic plane. Miles was an unusual choice. They had little experience of making high-performance aircraft. They built training and experimental planes. But they did have a reputation for innovative design. We, I think, made more experimental aircraft than any other firm. All sizes, shapes. Um, they came along with some crazy ideas. The design team faced a daunting task. Their brief was to build a plane capable of flying at a thousand miles an hour, almost twice as fast as any aircraft had ever flown before. We were a little bit shaken, of course, because uh, up to that time we'd thought that the speed of sound um, was something in the distance which we couldn't uh, approach. I mean, we, we make airplanes go faster and faster, but uh, the speed of sound was so far ahead, we just couldn't get through the sonic barrier. The Ministry required us to make the airplane and get it flying at 1,000 miles an hour in nine months, which we th even at that time we thought was a bit much. But um, of course we thought we could do it. We'd make anything fly. What they came up with was the M52, a totally new concept in aircraft design. The uh, only object that uh, we have information on going faster than the speed of sound, that was bullets. So that we went for the information on bullets and used that information for the fuselage. 
the thinner the wing, the faster it will go. So you had to have a very thin wing. And the thinner the wing, the more difficult it is to make it strong enough. So anyway, we chose a thin wing and then had to test it. Much of the testing and construction of Britain's supersonic plane was recorded by a Miles Aircraft camera team. The footage has not been shown before. The wing was put onto um, an ordinary 200 horsepower Mars aircraft and it was flown and it behaved very well. But we were quite confident that with the tests we did that um, all these things would work because we checked them as we went along the line. Just two months after the British team began work, America entered the race to break the sound barrier. The decision was taken at a wartime gathering of some of the country's top aviation experts. They were worried about America falling behind Britain and Germany. To keep up, they decided to build a plane to explore the unknown region near the speed of sound. Using jet engines, we have the opportunity to build a high-speed research plane to provide much-needed aerodynamic information. It'll be possible to obtain much-needed data from tests in level flight at speeds now attained only in dives. We should build enough experimental units for a continuous testing program. By December 1943, three countries had entered the race to be first to break the sound barrier. There's no question in my mind that the, the British were ahead of us. I had a lot of friends in Europe and I knew their integrity, I knew their approach, I knew their philosophy, different than ours, so why don't we throw it together? So I think we were motivated to compete and I'm sure they were motivated to compete with us. The Bell Aircraft Corporation, as it was called in the 1940s, was asked to build America's supersonic plane. Its founder, Larry Bell, had a reputation for getting things done rapidly and on budget. But many of the design team doubted his chance of success. There were a considerable amount of pessimism that was the environment at that present time. And this fit down to the designers even themselves. How strong do I have to build the airplane? What do I have to build the airplane to accommodate? And these were unknowns and big questions at that time. Well, there are a lot of people that uh, said it was impossible. And that's what they talked about, the sonic wall. The sonic wall, that means like a brick wall. And a lot of people accepted that. My personal feeling is that uh, let's go step by step and use all the tools and knowledge in Europe, anywhere we could find it, and put it together and see what we come up with. The Americans had as little information to work with as had the British. They were desperate for hard facts. To get them, a team of American experts flew to Britain in 1944 to find out what Miles aircraft were up to. The idea was that they had uh, decided that it was a good idea to make a supersonic aeroplane and they had heard that we were making one. So they came over to England with the idea that they would have all the information that we had accumulated. The idea being that in a fortnight later we would go to America and they would give us all the information that Americans had got. Um, but um, after the Americans had got the information, taken the drawings away, within a fortnight when we were trying to arrange the visit, they just said sorry, secrecy, the Pentagon says you can't. The race was hotting up. If the Americans were months behind the British, they were years adrift of the Germans. By 1944, Germany already had a vehicle that could travel faster than sound, the V-2 rocket. Because it went faster than sound, the V-2 arrived before you heard it coming. You heard it coming after it had gone off bang on the ground. And it was pretty disturbing to the populace. And not too much was said about it in the papers when they arrived. But people knew that they were being assaulted. 
the Germans had what in effect was interplanetary missiles when nothing else had been thought in that line before. But the V-2 was unmanned, and the prize would go to the country that first flew a piloted plane through the sound barrier. Early in 1945, the British seemed to be well ahead. The Miles team were constructing a full-scale mock-up of the plane. They were confident it would work, but they did have plans to cope with the disaster. The cockpit was held on by four or five metal bars. Those had explosive charges around them, and uh, if he had to get out, um, he would uh, explode those and the whole cockpit would leave the aeroplane, and then he would be in a capsule, which would be completely safe. It was really a modern ejector seat, so we were doing what they are now doing 50 years ago. The cockpit was exceptionally small. Therefore, the pilot had to be of small stature. You were almost supine in the aircraft, and the nose wheel, when it retracted, was lying straight between the pilot's legs. So it was going to be somebody pretty well of my stature. I'm of the order of five feet seven, and um, it, you couldn't really get anybody bigger in there. And the pilots themselves, they thought it was jolly fine idea. They all wanted to have a go. Oh, yes, they thought it was absolutely the, the, the excellent idea to have a go. There was no, no suggestion that there was unfair risk in any... any contents at all. The end of the war ended Germany's hopes of being first to fly a piloted plane faster than sound. But the Germans had been very close to the finishing line. The Allies finally got their hands on the Messerschmitt 163 a German plane powered by a rocket motor. It flew to the very edge of the sound barrier, but its wings were not suitable for supersonic flight. The ME-163 was the first really genuine flying rocket aeroplane, with an endurance of only about 10 minutes at, uh, of flight at full power, but going getting on for the speed of sound, not actually, about 90% up towards it, and pretty formidable, but also killed a lot of its very uh, brave test pilots, including two women who flew those things. It was dangerous because, firstly, it was going faster than anyone had encountered before, and therefore going out of control on occasion. And secondly, because these rocket fuels blew up and blew the thing to smithereens. Rockets might be dangerous, but they could deliver enormous thrust. And in 1945, the Americans took a crucial decision. Unlike Britain, they had little experience with jet engines, and they decided the rocket motor gave them the best chance of breaking the sound barrier. Abandoning the jet engine was controversial. Personally, I had some reservations about a rocket when you see them operate, because it's like a small explosion. But it would get you to the area of interest a heck of a lot quicker, and I'm not sure that uh, we knew that much about a jet engine, the time to get there, and all the aerodynamic problems of getting the air to the engine. Uh, the rocket appeared to be the simplest. Britain had a very good reason for not following the American lead. Whittle had made a special engine, being six or seven times the thrust of any propeller-driven or jet engine at that time, and with such a tremendous increase in power, the sky was the limit. Uh, we were expecting to fly at about six months' time, it's at that stage, um, for the test flights. Early in 1946, Miles Aircraft received a letter from the Ministry of Aircraft Production. They found the contents hard to believe. We were all extremely surprised. All the problems we thought were over, 
Um, we got a sound aeroplane. Everybody agreed it was going to be a, a success. So when you've got a success, such an advance compared with anybody else in the world, and you just get a memo, please stop. One is shaken, to say the least of it. If somebody had given us a reasonable reason for its cancellation, we wouldn't have been, you know, we wouldn't have been too worried. We'd just accept it. But not giving a reason for it, just cutting it out, a successful, it's like sort of getting an aeroplane onto the airfield and uh, ready for test flying, and then somebody says, oh, don't bother, throw it away. It's, um, I mean, it just is, it's out of this world. You can't believe such a thing from happening. I really couldn't see the logic in the cancellation. Everything pointed to a good potential chance of success. And I was really quite hopping mad at the time when it um, was cancelled. For 50 years, the cancellation of the M52 has been the subject of fierce argument. Ben Lockspizer was the civil servant who abandoned the project. He said it was too dangerous. For the first time, we can reveal why he came to this decision. At the end of the war, Lockspizer had visited a secret aircraft research laboratory near Munich in Germany. All that remains today is the blocked up entrance. But some of Germany's most talented aircraft designers once worked here on designs that convinced Oxpizer the M52 would never break the sound barrier. Now, I had the opportunity just after the end of the war to fly to Germany to have a look at what they were doing or had been doing. One of the eye-openers, which uh, certainly uh, impressed Benny Lock Spicer very much, was the quite novel idea of highly swept back wings. And they had advanced swept back wings which enabled them to go much nearer to the speed of sound. Benny Lock Spicer came back from Germany convinced that swept wings were the only solution. And so he cancelled the Miles aeroplane on the grounds and genuinely because he was a very uh, uh, kindly man that he, if he allowed it to go forward he'd be putting test pilots at very grave risk of the aeroplane going out of control. It was perfectly strong enough to withstand anything that the pilot could withstand and there was no suggestion that the aircraft would go out of control. Our job was to get through the speed of sound to a thousand miles an hour with the minimum of risk and the greatest of certainty. A straight wing gets through the speed of sound Maximum certainty, maximum safety, and it does the whole job. If we made a swept back wing, it wouldn't have helped us at all. But with a straight thin wing, right through the sound barrier, right up the other side, 1,000 miles an hour, no trouble at all. In December 1945, just days before Britain's hopes were ended, the Americans had unveiled their supersonic plane. It was called the Bell X-1, and it looked remarkably like the M-52. It even had perfectly straight wings. Without question, we actually had more information on the straight wing, so if you sized up the various advantages and disadvantages, the, we had the, the smallest degree of risk to enter an area that uh, we didn't have all the answers for to go with the straight thin wing. Frankly, I was a little surprised that the British didn't go ahead because uh, I have a gut feeling they, they, they could have made it. With all due respect to the people who are responsible for the cancellation, I think they made a mistake. The meteors of the RAF high-speed flight are out for new records. Britain might have dropped out of the race, but for a while at least, it would stay ahead of the world with its high-speed planes. Leading the flight is Group Captain Donaldson. 
The Meteor was Britain's first jet fighter. It would never fly faster than sound, but in 1946, it did break the official world speed record, flying at 616 miles an hour. And we all trooped down there to see Donaldson fly these meteors as fast as they'd go. And the meteor was pushed up and pushed up, and on a nice fine day with the right temperature, achieved a little over 600 miles an hour, which was getting on for the speed of sound, although not actually the speed of sound. This was really something to be proud of and carried us forward for a bit in that lean period after the war. But Britain would not hold the record for very long. In 1947, the Bell X-1 was handed over to the American Air Force. The pilot chosen to fly the plane through the sound barrier was Chuck Yeager. But I came up as number one because Number one, I could fly airplanes. I'd been to test pilot school, and, and I understood machinery. And because the X-1 would, would blow up on you real easy if you didn't know the system. And consequently, I knew the systems. A lot of the systems in the X-1 were systems that my dad used in the natural gas fields in West Virginia. And I used to work on the diaphragms and the pressure regulators that were in the X-1 or similar. And so it was easy for me. Bell X-1 was taken to Muroc Flight Test Center in California for its record-breaking attempt. The X-1 was not designed to take off from the ground. It would have used up too much rocket fuel. Instead, it was flown up to its launch height, strapped underneath a B-29 bomber. On October the 10th, Jaeger reached 668 miles an hour. Suddenly, he faced the very problem that had foiled everyone else. When we got the airplane up to 94% of the speed of sound, and I'm sitting out there, and I decided to turn the airplane, I pulled back on the control car, nothing happened. The airplane just went the way it was headed. And I said, man, we've got a problem. So I raked the rockets off and jettisoned the liquid oxygen and alcohol, and came down and landed, and got the engineers together, and we had a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. So we got a problem, and because the airplane may pitch up or pitch down, I've lost the ability to control it. Thin wings could not on their own keep the plane in level flight. But the Americans thought they had the answer, a new all-moving tail. Other planes could only move a small portion of the tail. On the X-1, the entire assembly could move. It hadn't been used before, but they thought it might stabilize the plane. First, it had to be checked out. And it's, it's really interesting. See, being a mechanic, all we did was take cowling off, squirt three and one oil on it, and run it up and down, up and down, until it worked. On October the 14th, 1947, they tried out the new tail for the first time. In fact, all of the mechanics, everybody was around the radar truck, because that's where you had our communication coming in. And we stood there, waiting, listening. And when you get up to around 12,000 feet, you got a seat-type parachute on, you get on a ladder, they let you down to your opposite the door, and you slide in feet first. Jaeger was in considerable pain. On the eve of the flight, he'd fallen off a horse and broken his ribs. You're in a very dark hole under the B-29, and when you drop clear of the B-29, you're in bright sunlight. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. When I got above 94% of the speed of sound, the nose begins to come up on the airplane. I just crank the leading edge up on a horizontal stabilizer, keep the nose down. And when we went a little faster, the Mach meter went off the scale. And uh, when it did, all the buffeting smoothed out because it was supersonic flow with the whole airplane. And even I knew that we'd gotten above the speed of sound. In about 
about that time, on the ground, we uh, <clears throat> heard a sonic boom. And we had a satisfying feeling that we'd gone beyond the speed of sound. That the unknowns that uh, were suspected, why uh, Chuck removed them. That's it. The big thing that came out of the whole program was that we found out in order to control the airplane through Mach 1, we had to have a flying tail on it. That was the first time we had experimented with this flying tail on the X-1. That really was the answer to flying at supersonic speed. At last, there was something to celebrate. But instead of a party, the Air Force ordered a news blackout. The flying tail was too important. It had to be kept secret. It lasted two months. In December, the story of the flight was on all the front pages. The Air Force cried foul and rounded on the culprit, the news editor of a specialist magazine who'd got a tip-off. The military thought a state secret had been given away and called in the FBI. I thought it was ridiculous. The Air Force had had a press conference in July in which they had unveiled the X-1 and released all of the technical specifications uh, of its uh, performance. There was no technical information in our story that hadn't been released six months before. The new tailplane wasn't even mentioned in the article. The FBI investigation was quietly dropped. But the security clamp still has its defenders. It was a very important secret. You know, I, I'd been in the military long enough and I'd fought in wars and understood security. And it paid off. It took the British and the French and the Soviet Union five years to find out that little trick that we found out with the X-1. It gave us a quantum jump on the rest of the world in aerodynamics. Had we blabbed our mouth, you know, they'd have known it at that time. But Jaeger was wrong to think the all-moving tale was a secret. The British knew all about it as well. We thought the ordinary controls wouldn't work above the speed of sound. Um, so we had to make an all-moving tailplane because an ordinary elevator uh, would mostly not function at all. We'd go up to the speed of sound, lose all our control, and the aircraft would crash. Several months after the X-1's historic flight, a British radio-controlled model of the M52 also broke the sound barrier. The key to supersonic flight was out in the open. They just dropped it, they just went woof with an automatic pilot, and it worked beautifully. It was nice to know, that was all, but uh, if it had been a full-size one, that'd be different. We knew it would work as well as that. I mean, it shows you how good the aeroplane was in the first case. It had taken years of struggle, determination and bravery to break the sound barrier. The pilots who risked all to achieve the impossible had now opened a new era in aviation. Aeroplanes flying at the speed of sound could now be seen as a real, genuine, practical possibility instead of just a dream as they had been earlier. Chuck Yeager in the X-1 started the new regime of supersonic flight. And here we are today, you can fly at twice the speed of sound to the United States in three and a half hours, which would have been unthinkable in the days before the X-1. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's the captain speaking. As we approach the point where we're going to start our acceleration to supersonic speed to fly through the sound barrier, you may feel two slight nudges of acceleration as they come in. And very soon after that, Concorde will accelerate through Mark 1, the speed of sound. That'll be the only sensation that you'll get as we travel faster than Mark 
Mach 1, which is a really sensational thing about Concord, there is nothing to feel. But today we'll be accelerating to Mach 2, twice the speed of sound for our crossing over the Atlantic. We'll maintain Mach 2, twice the speed of sound for just over two hours, 20 minutes, before starting our deceleration descent toward New York, where we're estimating arriving on time.